welcome back to Diaspora Network. Her books have become household names, read across continents, and many say it's very easy to get engulfed in the plot, in the narrative, and just everything that she has to offer. It is this artistry that has transformed Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie into an award-winning, best-selling author. Let's show you how it went when we sat down with her. Born in Enugu, southeast Nigeria, and the fifth of six children, Chimamanda's early life was spent in Nsoka with her parents. She's always been a voracious reader, and on this occasion, she starts off by telling us what inspires her to write such compelling stories. I'm always watching the world, I'm always observing, I'm always asking questions. I'm, so I'm inspired by things that um, don't necessarily happen to me because my life is kind of boring, so other people's lives are more interesting. I like to think that, um, that, this, that my storytelling is a gift that I was, I was blessed with. I've known that I wanted to tell stories from the time I was three years old. And nobody taught me that. But what I had to learn, and what I'm still learning, I think, is the best way to tell the story. So As I, he talks about the importance of being inspired, she is slightly amused by the myths around the source of an author's creativity. Yes, there are spirits from my um, from Abba Numunachi, where my parents are from, that come to me at night. No, I think um, I mean I think I think it depends on the writer. So I have writer friends who are very um, very clinical about their approach to writing. For me, it's not as um, clear cut. I, I like to say that. Sometimes I feel as though um, I'm a kind of conduit. I sometimes feel like something is speaking through me that I'm not entirely in control of, of the stories that I tell. Because sometimes I'll start off um, writing something and I have an idea where I want to go, but I don't actually know where I'm going. And sometimes the characters kind of just take over. So in that sense, there's something almost, um, almost magical for me. And while she speaks about the magic of inspiration, she does experience a dry period. Well, you know, yeah, I have those dark periods when the writing just isn't happening. And I want it to happen, but it's not happening. Staying a little bit still on, on your writing, looking at um, great writers, Chinua Achebe, um, etc. He started off in the sciences, you started off you know, with medicine, and then you ended up in the humanities as well, um, just as, as, as he did. Is there, do you see similarities between yourself and, he, and him in terms of the way um, the writing morphed? Or, or, or just how do you see that, that relationship? I think maybe if there's a similarity, it's simply that we both come from a culture and a society that has these expectations of people who do well in school. So if you do well in school, they just, people just assume automatically you have to be in the sciences. And then you find yourself being pushed in that direction, even though that's not what your heart wants. And that's what happened to me. And, I did well in school and everybody said you have to be a doctor and I, I kind of thought all right I'll be a doctor but I always knew that I wanted to write and I had planned really from the beginning that even if I became a doctor I would still write um, and so my plan had been that I would become a psychiatrist and and I would see my patients during the day and then at night I would write my fiction based on my patient stories so I thought that would work out well but I think at some point you realize um, especially for me I had such a a need to write. Um, I wanted to read and write. I didn't want to. I didn't want to be a doctor, and I, I don't think I would have made a good doctor. So I think leaving, leaving the study of medicine was um, really probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. The fruits of that decision to pursue her writing with passion are clear for the world to see. We were curious to know if sometimes she feels pressured to keep it up. Um. Really, so the pressure. I remember when I wrote um, Half of a Yellow Sun, and I had put so much into it. That novel was, um, you know, it took so much from me emotionally. And when it came out and it did well, I remember saying to friends of mine that I had earned the right to write a bad novel. Um, and so I, I don't think I felt pressure to write something that would do well. I think instead I felt pressure to please myself. Um, I'm, I'm a, a person, I think most creative people are like that. I'm, I think I'm, I can be quite hard on myself and so when I'm trying to write and it's not going well, it's, it's a really difficult place to be in. It's not so much pressure that, oh, I have to write the next book and it has to do really well. Instead, it's pressure that 
My God, I'm terrified that I may not be able to write a sentence that I like. Many budding authors who see Chimamanda's success may not realize that she has rejection stories of her own. In the US, I had made the decision that I was going to learn how publishing works and that I was going to publish a novel. And I did a lot of research. This was sort of before the internet was a big thing. So I went to the library, I looked everything up, and they said you have to send out um, a, brief, a brief section of your novel to agents. And so I started doing that. And I was so sure that I had written a wonderful novel. <laughs> so when I started getting rejections, I just thought, what's going on? And, and very briefly crushed my spirit because you, know, you get rejection after rejection after rejection that you start to think, wait, what's wrong? Maybe I shouldn't even be writing. And at some point, I realized that maybe the problem was that I was sending out the wrong thing. So I had written a novel that didn't feel true to me, but I felt it was the kind of novel that Americans would want to read. And so at some point, I put that aside, and then I started to write Purple Hibiscus, which was actually what, what felt true to me. It was what my heart wanted. And then I started sending that out. And also, I got many rejections. Most of them said, Oh, I like your writing, but nobody knows where Nigeria is. You know, nobody cares. I had an agent who said to me, why don't you write about the US instead? But I kept sending things out. And finally, I think there were maybe about 17 rejections for Purple Hibiscus before somebody said yes. We sought her views on feminism and the infamous TEDx talks where she spoke frankly about equality. I still think fundamentally that feminism is about equality and so it's a justice movement and it's it, I've never understood why people who believe in equal human rights don't embrace it. I still don't entirely understand why it's why for so many people it's a controversial idea that women want to be considered full human beings. Um, when I gave the talk I actually didn't think it would be so you know <laughs> widely viewed. I gave the talk at a TEDx conference that was focused on Africa. And I remember thinking, this is not the kind of audience that necessarily wants to hear that word feminism. But that's why I wanted to talk about it. But also, I wanted to talk about it in a way that's very accessible. And we know how women are judged differently for the same behavior that men show, so that a man who who shows a certain behavior is said to be very authoritative and confident. But a woman shows the same behavior and she's said to be arrogant and bossy. So all of those things, you know, people recognize them, but to give language to them, I think means then that we can start to talk about them and most of all that we can start to find ways to stop them. We couldn't let her go without finding out if there's a connection between her unique fashion and her literary craft. I like kinky hair, I like black hair. I think it's beautiful. Um, yeah, and really, it's important for me to be who I am. I don't want to live a life of trying to be what I'm not or apologizing for who I am. And I've also never felt that one should try to please everyone. And so obviously, I know that kinky hair is not what is considered mainstream beautiful. But then for me, I'm interested in questioning who determines mainstream beautiful anyway. On a personal note, Chimamanda gives us insight into the reasons why she wrote notes on grief after the loss of her dear father. It brings a kind of um, a temporary comfort because if you're, at least for me, giving language to what I'm feeling helps me. So sometimes when I'm anxious or I'm upset, I often say to myself, all right, sit down and tell yourself what is it that you're feeling, right? And why are you feeling that way? Name it. And I find that helpful. And so writing about my father shortly after he died was really just that I was doing what I, I have often done with emotions. And, and I also just wanted to celebrate a remarkable man that I adored, that I adore. Um, but close your note, I, I think grief is, I think I'm going to live with, with my grief for the rest of my life. And here are her interesting views about her reading culture and advice for aspiring authors. I read three or four books at the same time. When I was younger, I could I'd focus on one book and completely immerse myself in it. Now, I just don't know why I can't. So I'm usually reading one non-fiction, one, one fiction, one book of poetry, and something else. That's, you know, and I read, I read everything. For, for young people coming up, it's really important to not apologize for being who you are. We might not be from the part of the world that is economically at the center, 
but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have you know sort of confidence and pride in who we are and I think I think I do think that people recognize and respect authenticity we don't want to pretend that we don't have problems in, in Nigeria what we want is to, to show that Nigeria is not only about our problems. And so sometimes I think that there are people who are so, um, so wounded by the way that we're portrayed in the West that they go the other extreme and they want to talk about only the good things. I think the narrative about not just Nigeria but Africa is changing very slightly. And I think that's because we have more storytellers from the continent telling our own stories. And when we do, when we tell them honestly, Whoever is sort of consuming the stories is forced to acknowledge that that it's not a single story, that we're not just about only negatives, right? That we that we have both.